Okay, we're back here live in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE.com. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE.TV's flagship uh, product. We go out to the events, extract the, the signal from the noise, and I'm joined with my co-host Dave Vellante. Um, we're here with Pauline Nist, longtime CUBE. Welcome back again. You're uh, uh, rivaling Pat Gelsinger for the most CUBE uh, <laughs> visits and, and sessions. We love it. And the top guest uh, <laughs> honor is Pauline. So hey. you know we love you. Yeah, Thanks for coming back yeah. on. Well, you got to get a trophy. Is, this is the one in Vegas thing that doesn't stay in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Broadcast this out to the world. Yeah, exactly. So we were actually talking about this last night, Dave and I and, 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 the, and the guys, to doing a SiliconANGLE TV after dark session. And doing, because there's so much going on at oh, yeah, that night, yeah. you know, the parties, yeah. everything's going on. Dark so, data. You know, so. <laughs> we would get a whole perspective on yeah. the business after the parties as opposed yeah. to before them. Stream it live, no on demand. If you don't watch, <laughs> it's gone. Yep, so yep. we need to have that kind of vibe <laughs> for Vegas. So uh, yep. Vegas after dark, Silicon <laughs> Angle after dark, special programming. Uh, if anyone's got any ideas, just send, an e send me an email. We'll, we'll get it on right away. Uh, well, welcome back. Uh, IBM uh, Information On Demand, obviously you're, you're at Intel, managing all the relationships. Um, IBM, obviously they're no stranger to computing. Right. They're accelerating performance on the hardware side, which is good for business with Intel. Um, but here at IOD, take us through the history. This is our first IOD uh, with Intel. We've been to IBM Edge. Um, give the folks a backdrop to what is IOD, what is the purpose of the show, and talk about IBM's transition to extend, expand on their performance with the, with the software. So, um, IOD is obviously information on demand. It's IBM's big software show, which is one of the reasons we're here, because we've been working. IBM's always been an OEM partner of Intel's. They build great System X machines, and now they've got their PureFlex systems and their blade infrastructure. Um, but above and beyond that, we view them as a serious software partner. When you look at who owns a compendium of software, a whole software stack that spans all of its, uh, its way up through you know, virtualization, through uh, operating systems, and, uh, virtual um, database, and now uh, big data, I also kind of look at IBM as the adult supervision of big data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, our last guest didn't, sl he didn't even slam Oracle. He just like talked about this. There's this other company. company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, as you know, I mean, we're we're thrilled here uh, working on with IBM on their PureFlex systems, which is kind of their answer to the Exa boxes that another vendor produces. So <laughs> we think anything that lets people uh, figure out what they need, buy it, turn it on, get it into production, get time to value faster is a good thing. So we work with all of these software partners to help them develop by end user solutions as opposed to just hardware, which was you know kind of the old game. Now it's how can we help you solve your problem? And I think IBM does that as good or better than anybody else. Talk about the adult supervision comment, because that's you know a really <laughs> good comment. Their performance over the past decade on the, on the stock price basis has right. been phenomenal. That's a direct result of their business acumen right. as a company. Um, but that also is from the products and the services right. they offer. And I'll say they kind of dumped their PC business in a way and then kind of moved into the services. Talk about um, why IBM is so important relative to that being an adult supervision supervisor because that means they're managing a lot of you know mission right. critical applications they're in all right. the big accounts they have history um, I why? think IBM brings two things to the table um, you can't argue with the portfolio of analytic solutions I mean there's certainly a lot of buzz and a lot of sex about Hadoop but what do you do with the data well who's got more tools to help you analyze model use the data in your enterprise than IBM. And then the second thing that IBM brings to the table is the business side of it, because I think one of the real upheavals that big data is going to cause, and as I, your previous guest just said, we're really only in the second inning, is big data is a business solution, not a technology solution. I think anybody who tries to go in and say, geez, you need to have a dupe, that's the wrong, the wrong sell. The real question is, how can you be more competitive? How can you be more successful in an environment where that's really a challenge these days. You've got to be out there differentiating yourself to the customer. Who knows how to sell the business solution better than IBM? Um, and if Hadoop and big data are really a business sale to the business, which then turns around and tells IT, this is what I want to do, how do you help me implement it? IBM knows how to do that. So IBM obviously a big services company. In fact, many people feel they've been you know, services led for the last right. several years. Um, but of course, made some huge investments in software, Cognos, and many, many others. What's your take? I mean, you've seen the, the business evolve. You know well Gerstner's call to make IBM a services mm -hmm. company as opposed to a product company. What's your take on the impact of all this big data? Does that increase the need for services? Are we, do we, are we going to see, I mean, services is still probably you know, two thirds of the IT business. Do you think that will shift, or do you think it actually escalates, all this complexity escalates the need for services? 
I think services is going to be there, but it's going to change. It's going to move from the kind of outsourcing, hosting kind of model to cloud, to big data, to solutions, as opposed to um, the mechanics of IT, which is really what services has been up till now. You go to these vendors because you want them to run the stuff, you want them to code it, you want them to maintain it. Sometimes you want to turn it all over to them and just write them a check. And I think um, we're seeing that you know, with some major moves like GM is going to bring all of its uh, processing back inside now. I mean, you know, this is, this is a cycle. Whatever you're, you're not doing today is what you ought to be doing tomorrow, I guess, is the best metric. Pauline, the other thing we've been tracking at uh, SiliconANGLE and Wikibon is, of course, companies are talking about um, the you know, software-defined data center. We're hearing a lot about mm -hmm. software-defined networking. We've, been we've talked about software-led infrastructure, uh, really you know, a new take on the infrastructure needed to provide the power, this sort of big data analytics. A lot of flash, you know, a, a, a lot of, you know, standardized components. What's your take on that whole software-led movement? I think people want the flexibility that the software definition brings. I mean, whether you're running COD or whether you're running big data, your needs change very often dramatically, very often very quickly. I mean, you know, the, the kind of examples people love to quote is it used to be you waited for monthly retail statistics. Now, the Saturday after Black Friday, you want to know how the sales were. Saturday morning, yeah. you know, not Saturday <laughs> afternoon. In the paper the next yeah, morning Yeah, exactly, or and or the stores want to understand, do I need to do more markdowns? Do I need to do fewer markdowns? What's moving? I mean, mm -hmm. right now, I was reading the Wall Street Journal this week that the grand panic is ensuing in retail because uh, the latest economic indicators say the consumers are opening up their wallets and all the retailers believe they're already understocked for Christmas, <laughs> that there's going to be more demand. So think about that rippling through the system. And um, you know that's the kind of business need that you see out there today. Um, but that's, that's real business. That's not playing around in the lab with something. That's bet your business on it, have to have the reliability, have to have the scalability, have to have the infrastructure to respond. And that's where the software-defined configurations can let you augment those configurations on the fly. So you can add capacity, you can add networking, you can add storage without having to reconfigure. Good. What about the uh, information management, old school versus the new school? I mean, when I say old school, I mean like just go back five years. Even though IBM's been in the database business, they've been doing a lot of that kind of unstructured, un you know, structured mm -hmm. solutions with their databases. But now, decision support systems has been an IT buzzword. What's going on in that market of decision support, information management, with big data and some of the emerging technologies? How do you view that market? Well, I think it's, um there's a little bit of a temptation right now to say, throw the baby out with a bad bathwater. You know, relational databases are old school, you don't need them. Um, because there's all this movement to unstructured and no SQL. And I mean, you only have to look around here at a lot of the partners that, uh, that have got booths up. And um, I think decision support used to be something that the big companies, you know, the Walmarts, the Targets, those guys used to do. Um, I think now uh, one of the vendors has used the term democratization of data. I think what, what these new tools are doing and what Intel is very happy to aid and abet is buy industry standard hardware, you know, put a pile of it together there in parallel, run these new, new tools to help you go through the data. But where um, suppliers like IBM come back in is that the tools that you need to do something with that data in the open source world are just starting to emerge. I mean, when you look at decision support modeling, um, those kinds of tools, it's going to take, quite frankly, the Apache community, I think, a little while to get something that's ready for prime time. And these guys will give it to you today. You know, um, hook up your Hadoop, hook up your Natiza, hook up your pure data, connect it all together, um, get the answers to the questions you want, and then, more importantly, once you get the answers to the questions, do the markdowns, do the transactions, turn it into dollars and cents. I think that's a services angle our writers should be on and post that on servicesangle.com because the system integrators are going to love that new new uh, concept because it's going to be more work for them. Um, but I want to ask you a little bit about um, um, Intel perspective on things. Obviously Moore's Law, we all love talking about Moore's <laughs> Law. But big data really highlights a couple things that's, that are going on. One is, there's a tsunami of data going on in the marketplace past 18 months. More data has been generated than the history of computing yep. that's been documented. They say the next year is going to be double that. So, so all this is going on, a lot of data is coming in old data, new data, data mashups, and then vertical markets. You're seeing greenfield opportunities for new things, new way, new applications that have never been done before. Uh, but then all of this is dependent upon essentially compute power, right? So more data means more crunching of numbers. So uh, what's the Intel perspective? Because that's a real, real uh, area. You see startups yep. trying to build new silicon, new solutions, new software. Um, this computing demand 
we thought we were good. Zillions of cores on the server. Right, um, right. We need more cores, right? right? right. You know, Scotty, give me more power, as they would say in Star Trek. But so talk about the Intel perspective around the computing, because the requirements to process more are now here, and they're going to continue to be here. Well, I think that Intel is um, is happy to see this turn into something that gobbles up silicon. After all, that's what we do for a business. So we like software-defined networking. We like, you know, we've got Xeons now and virtually all the storage controllers that are out there. One of the big moves, obviously, is the whole SSD move where you're really getting storage into the silicon arena now, not just rotating devices, which I think is going to be a game changer. I think a couple of years from now, Every piece of data in the world is going to be on something that's that's, that's semiconductor based. Woohoo! <laughs> well, you know, you, everybody wants faster access. You know, it's you still need the pile of backing store and hierarchical store. You know, that's going to be kind of the next frontier of who you buy that storage stack from. Um, but also, you're seeing the move to different kind of cores. I mean, you know, we're looking at we're building our. Um, our many integrated core phi architecture because we think that there's a certain element of actually big data that if you're really, really analytics bound wants to have cores that can do uh, processing on columnar store, processing on different structures of data really, really fast. There's this crossover between the high performance computing world and the big data world that's also happening in some sectors. So we're looking to innovate wherever we can because we think that if you can get the silicon being part of the solution, you can drive costs down, you can drive performance up, which then opens the market to even uh, more new applications. So a key, uh, you mentioned applications, a key to that vision is really the application, I ISVs really exploiting yeah, that new absolutely. hardware ar architecture. Are they, in your view, moving fast enough in that, in that direction? Or is, uh, certainly there's a segment of people, you know, we're going to have Aerospike on uh, this later this mm -hmm. week, we had them on. I mean, they're doing it, we know that, mm -hmm. you know, doing atomic, you know, rights with Fusion I.O., all that crazy stuff. Right. Do you see the, the traditional ISVs doing that? And, and, and will they, will they have to in order to really drive this movement forward? Oh, we absolutely do. I mean, we have in our Xeon course today a set of advanced vector instructions that were done for scientific processing for vectors. And every database player out there is using them for columnar stores. Because what's a columnar store mm. but a vector? You know, and they found that the speed up that they can get from turning those things on is just tremendous. So, um, I, you know, people move at different, different spaces, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of hopscotching in terms of new apps versus the traditional guys, but I don't underestimate the fact that, um, that when you get into the big business world, um, you know, you're going to see a lot of work in the next couple of years, as you said earlier, on making Hadoop more real time, making Hadoop reliable. People are looking at HDFS and what other options might be because you want something that's going to have um, the mission critical characteristics if you're going to bet your business on it. You don't want it to be down the day you need to reprice or down the day you got a patient in front of you in healthcare. You know, you, uh, you're going to see this crossover to the world where people, you know, the the best thing that can happen to a new technology is that people love it and want to rely on it. But the minute they want to rely on it, it has to become dependable, it has to become more robust, has to become scalable, has to have all of the attributes that they're used to. Well, and you're talking about decision support before. I mean, you know, Walmart's, the great examples. But in reality, there were probably only a handful of people really using those systems yep. within organizations. They had major productivity and oh, put the beer next to the diapers and watch what yep. happens to yep. sales. But there was just a handful of analysts using it. The democ democratization of data that you put forward means a lot more people are going to oh, be using absolutely. it in theory. And so that, absolutely. and that real time nature really changes <laughs> the, the infrastructure uh, uh, resilience right. that you have right. to have there, right. doesn't it? Exactly, I mean, I'm, I'm waiting to walk into a 7-Eleven and have to scan a QR code, you know, to, let them know what I'm doing as a customer and what I buy from them. <laughs> <laughs> so they have the stuff that you want. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, it's uh, that's what you want. You want that micro customization that you only get with the decision support. Right. So we have some tw uh, comments, tweets. Obviously, they loved your adult supervision uh, comment, but also I'm getting a little message from uh, some folks out there. One is um, uh, my friend sitting with uh, a CTO of a startup, and the question is, uh, um, how does IBM's IOD information on demand help? that startup CTO make a rapid decision, rapid decisions faster, better? Is it human dashboards? Is it humans dashboards? I mean, how does, how does this all, this world relate to, you know, an entrepreneur out there who's trying to make, make something new happen in a big way? Well, I think for somebody like an entrepreneur, you have to figure out what the most important data is to you as you go forward. Is it your employee data? Is it your customer data? Is it your competitive data? Because if you're out there with an idea, you want feedback from your customers. 
um, you know, because you're still trying to tune the product. I mean, in the early days of any startup, the product you go out with is frequently not the product you end up with. And the only way you cross that, that gap is to figure out what the customers like, what they don't like, you know, what they're willing to pay for, what they're not willing to pay for. Um, and I think all of those things can be gathered in a variety of ways. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. I mean, there are vendors up and down the scale, uh, as you well know, you know, because we've been at all their conferences, where, you know, you, you, what we love about them is that they almost always start with a Xeon system, regardless of whose software you run. But, you know, you don't have to pay, a, a, you know, a million dollars and sign a support and a services contract. Um, people are trying to do stuff that you can use on your laptop. So, I mean, I think that's, that's the battle, which is... Yeah, they got two choices. They can turn key with an IBM or oh. scale out open source with a Hadoop yep. solution. Yep. Yeah, you got Tableau, I see them here and you see other visualization uh, software And you even have people like Microsoft, God forbid, doing stuff you can do in Excel, you know? <laughs> awesome. Or you even have guys like Oracle saying, big data, meet big iron. Right, so you can, right, if you want, right. you can bring in a million and a half dollar infrastructure to run your big data analytics, or you can run it on your laptop. <laughs> so my final big question I for you. I think the startup <laughs> starts on the laptop and hopes they grow to the big yeah. iron phase, you know? <laughs> so we're trying to do a big question for a big insightful answer every uh, in the cube here. So my big question uh, around IBM IOD is, looking forward, knowing IBM, obviously you have a relation with them, the big Intel customer, what's going on here at IOD? What's going to, how do you see IBM progressing forward? Where else you mentioned, I see the business analytics and they have the business uh, feet on the street and solutions. How do you see IBM taking big data today and play those next few innings out for, for, the, for the crowd out there in your mind's eye? Well, I think even the big change between IOD this year and last year is um, the focus this year is really on the, the big data side of it as opposed to the whole portfolio. And I mean, this is the show where they try and sell all their software assets, but this year it's how do you incorporate big, you know, big data solutions in the hardware, big data solutions in the TISA. And I think they're going to be looking um, primarily to connect their stuff together, together better because when you have a portfolio like that, you want a way to seamlessly move the data from Hadoop to whatever tool that you want um, so that you can, you can get to results more quickly. And if I were IBM, that's certainly what I'd be concentrating on doing. <laughs> Well, the, in the world has, has for the last, let's say, 12, 18 months said, all right, we'll, we'll make connectors, yep. you know, where we can connect, the, get, get, do, do your filtering in the batch, and then we'll bring it over to us, mm -hmm. which is real time. But you're starting to see, and you'll see a lot of announcements this week, and we've seen some. We saw one from Hadapt. You'll see some other announcements it's coming a, from MapR, right, exactly. and Hortonworks, Caldera. and Cloudera, yep. that are really trying to make that a native capability. Right. Um, that feels like it's the right direction, you yep. know, versus sort of a Band-Aid approach. Do you agree with that? Or? I agree with that, but I also think um, that it's going to take a while to get to maturity on those mm -hmm. solutions. I mean, quite frankly, open source is moving very quickly and there are a lot of bright people doing work that I'm really, really excited about, but um, is it yet crossed over into the bet your business side of, of being robust as opposed to still being something that you're uh, experimenting so with? So what's your take on, um, so for instance, you get some you know, SQL merging with the NoSQL guys. Yeah, that's right. You think people will be willing to give up, the SQL practitioners willing to be give, give up some of the SQL function in order to get that integration, that unification, or will they wait? Um, I think, quite frankly, you know, that SQL's not dead and buried. It's a language that a whole lot of people know how to do stuff with, and what you connect it to on the back end can change. But as an API, mm. I think it has a lot of value for how you connect a lot of talent that's out there in the world to the new world of what's emerging. So I would not be surprised to see a focus on putting that, those, uh, you know, the SQL API into some of the Hadoop uh, open source technology because it's just going to be a way to enable people to access, yeah, people think, to access I stuff. I think you're right, I think that's exactly what you're and, and I guess the premise, my premise would be that people will be giving, willing to give up some of that your know, traditional SQL function in SQL mm -hmm. with that SQL right, API right. in order to get to the new stuff. Exactly, and exactly. And then, you know, let the SQL, you know, the, 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 the new SQL guys catch up. Yeah, you know. exactly. Pauline, thanks for coming on theCUBE again. We'd love to hear your perspective. You're a great uh, thought leader, a uh, great technical person, and obviously you work at Intel, very relevant, even though your earnings were down. Um, <laughs> I wrote a great blog post to highlight uh, the reason why everyone doesn't understand how the PC business is moving to more, <laughs> more processors and components. So, yep. um, Still, you guys have made some great investments. We're happy to have you on theCUBE. And uh, decision support and big data and uh, compute powers still in demand. And uh, we're going to be covering it like a blanket here inside theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest right after this short break. <laughs>